devil in the teeth with our praise. Come on. The gates of hell will never stand a chance. Your name prevails. Jesus, so when I am, no word will fail. No weapon for the dead. Your name
Holy Spirit is in this room. Come on, can't church. Before we can move forward in this time of worship, I felt the Lord speak that this is where we're going to really press in. We're starting a new series today called Spiritual. It's called This Means War. It's about spiritual warfare. And I know there's people in this place that have been in a struggle. For some of you, that struggle has been years. Some of those struggles might have just been days, had a crazy week. But listen, I know a lot of people in this place have been in a battle. And maybe you even have people that you've been battling for and wanting to see come. Let me tell you, there's a struggle. Even to get through these doors sometimes, it's a struggle to get into the presence of God. How many people know what I'm talking about? And I heard the Lord say, let my people come to me with their struggles. Let my people come to my altar and watch what I do in their lives. So before we can move forward in this service, I'm asking you to search your heart and simply ask this question. If God is asking the church to press in, is he talking to me? Is the Lord speaking to you this morning that there are some battles? Can I tell you sometimes all we can do is wait on the Lord? And this morning we're going to sing and we're about to go deep into worship and you might have things that you're going through, but listen, don't stand where you are. The Lord has spoke this morning. Come to my altar. Come to me and watch what the Lord does. So right now, all across this place, if you believe that the Lord needs to do a breakthrough, a miracle in your body, the altars are open and the Spirit of God is here. We're waiting on Him. Come on, church. Let's sing together. Holy Spirit a moment right here Lord you see every every heart right now and Father in the name of Jesus break every chain I feel the chains of addiction of anger 
depression. I'm telling you, even last night, you were saying, I wasn't sure I'm going to make it. I, I hear the Lord saying, let me break that chain, but you gotta, you got to surrender over to it right now. Let the Lord work. Holy Spirit, this is your moment. This is your power being demonstrated in the church. Holy Spirit, have your way. If you've been dealing with the depression, I want you to lift your hands to heaven. And I want you to say with your own mouth, say no more. No more depression in my home. No more depression in my room. You've been dealing with anxiety. I want you to say no more. I declare you're speaking it out under the anointing, under the spirit of God. Wait on you, Lord. You've been fighting for your marriage. And there's a voice in your head saying, this isn't going to work. Hear what the Lord is saying. Just like he told Adam in the, in the garden. Who told you that? Who's been lying to you? He is the God who can restore. He is the God who can renew. He is the God who can rebuild what was broken. That voice telling you, it's just going to happen again. Nobody's going to love you. See, we're tearing down the lies of the enemy in the presence of God. There's some people standing out there thinking, oh, I don't need to go to the altar. There's a voice in your head saying, you don't, got no, you don't need to go there. But the Lord has showed you that he wants to bring you to higher ground, into higher places in your career, in your business. But you want to do it by your own thinking. And the Lord is saying, "Can you? will you learn how to come deep and worship with me? And watch, I will elevate you. It's not going to be by your degree. It's not going to be by just your intelligence alone. Will you come before the Lord and say, God, will you lift me up out of my situation? The altars are open. We're worshiping God for who he is and what he can do when we submit our hearts to him. We love you, Lord. We worship you. Go ahead. Take us there. We love you, Jesus. Come on, let's keep worshiping the name of Jesus in this place. God, 
reigns. Come on, lift him up. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns forever all my days. Hallelujah. worship one more one more minute amen just put your hands to the heavens the Holy Spirit is in this place and he just wants to remind you that no matter your situation that doesn't define who you are before him this morning we're free and we worship you Lord we're no longer afraid. We're no longer slaves to fear. We're no longer slaves to anxiety. And we want to worship you, Lord, with all we got. We love you, Lord. Come on, just keep worshiping the Lord one more time. We love you, Jesus. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Come on, sing it out. I am a child. Come on, church, sing it out. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. Come on, church, sing it out. I'm a longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. Somebody can't believe it in this place. I'm no longer slave. Whoa. I am. A Come on, church, lift your voice and say. Whoa, whoa, come on. Whoa, 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 come on. church you rescue me so I stand and sing come on I am a child of God come on church you split the sea so I could walk right through it my So I stand and sing. Come on. I am a child of God. Come to church. Sing it out. I am a child 
tocar I am a child of God I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear Come on church I am of God Come on church I'm no longer We love you Jesus I am a child of God Wow I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave Can you did you feel did you feel the weight did you feel it come off of you Worship moves the heart of God. When you respond to the Lord's call, He comes. He lifts that weight. He tears down those lies so that you can claim victory and say simply, I am a child of God. If you believe that, can you give the Lord some praise in this place? God, you are so good. You're so wonderful. Listen. Listen, you have to understand how much God loves us. Despite our mess, despite who we are and what we've done, God loves us so much that he made a way that you can come into his house with your sin and your brokenness. You can come right to the front to his altar and into his presence and worship him and say, I'm a child of God. And God says, yes, you are. You're my child and I love you. And you can hear it. You can feel it. Father, right now, we thank you we worship you. We magnify your name. We pray that every heart in this place would walk out of here victorious today, set free from the oppression of the enemy, and equipped today, God, to fight the spiritual battles, God. I pray that every heart would be open, every mind ready to receive what you have for them today. I cast out every lie of the enemy, every work of darkness right now. Freedom is in this house. Right now, God, freedom for transformation is in this house. From young to old, God, you will speak and transform. If you believe that, can you give the Lord a shout one more time and say amen. Say it is done. Amen. This word is for me. This word, this moment is for me. This day of victory is for me. Let's do this, church. We're going to move along because God's going to teach us something today. Turn around, greet somebody, welcome them into the house of God. We are just getting started. God is going to do some amazing things. Get ready. We got some technical difficulty going on with the lights and everything funny happening. But why not? It's a week of spiritual warfare. Why not have stuff go funny? Because we don't need everything to be perfect for us to serve a perfect God, right? For us to worship a perfect God, we don't need everything in our lives to go perfectly. So this morning, I'm just grateful to be in this. How many people are grateful to be in the presence of God? He is so amazing. Listen. I just got a few announcements to make. We are we got big plans, big things. The first thing I want to tell you about, well, first let's do this. Any first-time guests in the place, if you'd raise your hand, we want to acknowledge all first-time visitors. If you're a first-time guest, I see a couple hands go up. That we're so glad you're here. Can we acknowledge them, church? We're glad that the first-time visitors are in the house. Listen, if you're a first-time guest, 
Everything we're about is to get you to encounter and experience the love of God. We want to make sure we connect with you. So there's a Connect Center right out these doors to give you a free gift to also get you plugged into everything that's happening. You can sign up for text alerts. You can hear about different things that are coming up. But all right, so I'm going to tell you a couple things that are really important. Number one. We are in this thing this month, this whole month, we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare, and we are having prayer every Saturday morning, and so far, it's been amazing. God has really showed up with prophetic words and just speaking directly uh, to our hearts. You know, it's been amazing to see what God is doing. So if you want to join us every Saturday morning at 9 a.m., we're having prayer. We also have girlfriends this month. It's coming up. You got to check with the back. We get the date girlfriends in the house. How many of you are excited and love girlfriends? Those dates are coming up. Trina's got some special stuff planned for it. And uh, oh, she's coming up here now. She can explain it a little bit more. But uh, also, men, men, man up. Come on, we got to do man up. Conference is coming up right around the corner. Listen, if you got to see Guillermo, you got to see the men's leaders, go to the Connect Center say, hey, I want to sign up for man up. How many appreciated Dr. Sam last week? Any men in the house appreciate what Dr. Sam, anybody appreciate Dr. Sam? Listen. He has texted me several times since he left. He knows that God is doing something special over here. There's something that we got to continue to pursue. But I know that God is going to speak to us men. If you've never been to Man Up, make sure you talk to me. Talk to Guillermo. Talk to Pastor John. We want to go up there together. It's an amazing time. More, Even more so than the conference itself, it's our time together. So let's ride up together. Let's ride up together. Let's spend some time together as men and see what God does. So man up, I, I forgot the price of it. I don't have the information in front of me up here. Guillermo, you got to tell you the price. There is a cost. We got a hotel, two nights. Uh, you want to make sure you get signed up for man up. So uh, Trina, anything else on the girlfriends? Or? I just wanted to say something about girlfriends. Girlfriends this month is going to be powerful. I just want to tell you ladies that we are in a season of prayer and going deeper in the Lord. And so girlfriends, this month is going to be a worship and prayer night. And I want to encourage you all to come out. We have a guest that's going to be with us, that's going to be leading us in worship. But this night is designed because actually um, we're going to be doing a church fast and we're going to be getting this information out. And so the church fast starts on October 18th. So the week of this um, girlfriends is going to be our fasting week. And I'm going to be posting some information about fasting, some good books for you guys to read. But we believe that God is doing something powerful in our midst here at Family Life. And we want to be prepared in the spirit. We want to be prepared in the word. And we're going to, we're going to go to war, ladies. We're going to get together and we're going to believe God to just break some things in Jesus' name. So I just want to encourage you to be here. It's going to be on October 19th. It'll be right here in the sanctuary. And we are believing God to move and do a miracle in our lives. Amen? So with that being said, before we get into the offering, church, uh, to this month is a special month. It is Pastors Appreciation Month. And we want to just take an opportunity. We got great pastors in this church. How many are grateful for their pastors and leaders? And, and let me tell you something. Trina and I, we're honored to be your pastors, but we could not do it alone. We have some amazing pastors that are with us. So will you guys help me honor them as we're going to call up and bring up the pastors up here. You're going to come. We got a gift for them. And we just want to kind of acknowledge them one by one. We're going to acknowledge them and all the great things they do. So if we can have them come on up. So Pastor Nora, can you guys come on up here? Pastor Nora, will you come up here? So, so Pastor Nora is running our prayer, holding it down in intercessory prayer, and she's working with a lot of women. Pastor Nora is a pillar of this church. Come on up here, Pastor Nora. We just got a gift for you. Church, are we grateful for Pastor Nora? Uh, <laughs> Pastor Albert and Lynette, come on up here. Powerful Bible study leaders, disciplers, come on up here. We're going to bless you guys. <laughs> You, yeah, let everybody see who you guys are. Listen, these are people you got to get to know, connect with. Pastor Al and Gloria, come on up here. Pastor Al and Gloria, these are the OG, original, original gangsters. Been in here holding it down spiritually before I was born. Just kidding, not that long ago. I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing with you. Listen, these are phenomenal people, wisdom to draw from. And then the last but not least, Pastor John and Alice, come on up here. Right here, they hold it all down. They hold it all down. They do a lot around here. Oh man. Yeah, it's kind of a kind of a jack move up here right now going on. Amen. Listen, uh, yeah, praise God. We we appreciate we appreciate every single one of you in the house. Amen. Come on, somebody. It's because we're a great church. Come on. 
It's the people of the church that make a great house. Amen. And so, listen, I, you know, I don't talk to him. You know, it's really hard to hide stuff from uh, Trina. I think if she really wanted to, she could be like an FBI agent or something. Amen. And so I got to go around, you know, I got to go talk to somebody here and talk to somebody there. And so, listen, I, I just want to tell everybody in this house, pastoring ain't easy. Pastoring ain't easy. It's an emotional roller coaster sometimes. It goes up, it goes down, it'll spin you all around. Amen. But pastoring is one of the greatest joys. If you are called to be a pastor, it's one of the greatest joys on this planet. Billy Graham said this. You know, do you realize that Billy Graham was offered and they said, you know, hey, Billy, you, you should run to become the president of the United States of America. And Billy Graham, you know, he met with all these different presidents and stuff like that, right? And he says, hey, Billy, you, you, you ought to be the president. And Billy Graham says, well, why would I want to lower myself? Come on, somebody. I just want to say to you guys, I know I can speak on, can I speak on behalf of the church this morning? Is that okay? Listen, it, I know it's, it's Pastor's Appreciation Day, and it's, you know, it's October 10th, and there's a designated day. But we're not doing this out of a designated day. Really, we're not. We're doing this out of honor, and we're doing this out of appreciation, and we're doing this out of love. I can tell you both for sure, this year has been one of the hardest years of my life. With my, with my dad, with all kinds of stuff. And you guys have been so key and so understanding and a blessing to me and my family. And so I wanted to say from the depth of my heart, thank you guys for being you. We appreciate you and all your hard work and everything that you do for the church. And I would prophesy to you today that whatever you're doing, however God will lead you, understand this, that you do not labor in vain. That the works of the Lord that the works of the Lord will continue to move through you, that God will continue to strengthen your hand, and God will give you clear strategies as to where to take this house to give him glory. Amen? Would you guys lift your hands up real quick? Come on. You know, oh, praise God. You want to stand up? Praise God. But why don't you lift your hands? We're going to pray for them. Amen. Father, I say thank you for all the pastors of this house. The pastors house. can come on up here. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. And Father, I just say thank you for all the pastors of this house. Pastor Albert and Lynette Sines, they have fought. They have fought over the years. Their family, God, we declare a blessing upon the Sines family. We thank you, Father God, for, for who they are and, and how you use their lives greatly in this house, God. Father, we say thank you so much for them. Father, for Pastor Al and Gloria, Father, we say thank you so much for them, God. Father, how you use their lives and continue to use their lives, Father God. Father, how we just pray an immense blessing and favor upon their home. Upon Pastor Nora, God, that God, you would continue to just overflow her house with blessing, God. Father, we just say thank you for who you are. Father, we declare over Pastor Richard and Trina right now. That, Father, that you would continue to strengthen their hand. Father, give them clarity. Give them strength. But, God, I pray this. We pray this that there's going to be an immeasur immeasurable favor upon their life. That, God, there's going to be immeasurable stamina upon their life, God. That, Father, that whatever their hands would touch shall prosper because you have caused their hands to prosper. You have caused it, God. Father, what they have been praying, God, I know and I feel in the spirit, God, that what they have been praying out, it's not what they're just praying out, but they are actually lining up with you. Father, we say thank you for the Hernandez family. Father, that you would bless their children, that you would bless their house, God, that you would cover their babies, God. Father, we just say thank you for this incredible couple that, Father, in this season, God, that you would just continue to do your mighty works through their lives. Father, we love you so much. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people say, amen and amen. amen. Praise God. Love you, bro. Wow. Church, listen, honor is the key to breakthrough and promise and blessing, and we just have to always honor what God has given us, what God has called us to. And honor is just such an important part. I didn't know John was going to come up here. We were just trying to honor them. 
But hey, that's the way God is good. He knows what he's doing. Church, so much I'm going to try to release today. But all I can say about the tithes and offering is can we continue to worship God? I'm grateful for his presence. I'm grateful. But honor is the key to breakthrough and blessing. Hear what I'm saying. Let's honor God in the area of our giving. Those that are watching online, those that are here, let's honor God in the area of giving. Trust me, you will see breakthrough. You will see miracle. You will see so much happens when we honor God, especially in the area of giving. So this morning, if you need an offering envelope, will you simply just raise up your hand? The ushers will come, and let's bring our offerings in honor to God to see. We want to see God's revival break out all over our city, all over our nation. And let's just honor God in this area. God bless you. Thank you for your giving. Let's bring our offerings up at this time. God bless everyone for their giving. God is so good. That was an amazing worship experience. That was just an amazing time. This morning, I just want to pray one more time because we're about to get into a subject matter that I believe is so important. So, Father, right now, all across this place, we just focus our mind and our heart and our attention towards your word. We pray, God, that we would receive it, God, with all that you intend for it to accomplish in our lives. If you're in this place, you say, I receive from you this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, some church, we're about to get into this. Oh, man, I'm like, I'm like, ooh, I'm like, like, almost shaking right now with anticipation because this has been on my heart for a long time, and I thought, what a perfect opportunity in the month of October where they say witches and warlocks, and they try to claim that October is their spiritual day, and they got Halloween on lock, and the 31st belongs to them. And I was like, later for that, they don't got a month. The devil don't have a month. The devil sure don't have a day. He don't have no power over the authority of God. Hello, somebody. So I wanted to get into this new series this means war. I wanted to talk about spiritual warfare because the devil is real. The battle is real. How many know the struggle is real? Hello? And we need to know how to fight, how to stand against the enemy and to overcome. The subject of spiritual warfare is important for every Christian to understand that, listen, if you are being divided in your home, if you are fighting a lot with your spouse and you are arguing with your brother, your sister, and you're getting mad at your church, you're getting angry at people, you're feeling depressed, or you're worried about money, hello, somebody. If you're saying things like, if I only had this, then I'd be happy, If I, and, and the church doesn't care about me and I'm not getting spiritually fed and and you're upset because your wife didn't say hi to you a certain way. If you're getting mad about all kinds of things, chances are you're having a spiritual battle and may not even realize it. The enemy wants to divide, bring confusion, wants you to be angry at people, judging people. He wants you to be unhappy. Hello, somebody. Unhappy with your church, unhappy with your life, unhappy with your kids. This is the work of the enemy. You can be having a spiritual battle and not even realize it. You know, we experience, you know, so much of what we experience in the physical world is influenced by the spiritual. So many people don't realize that a lot of things that go unseen affect us in the natural world. Things that we don't see with our eyes are having influence and effect on us in our everyday 
lives. The spiritual influence is the physical. Hello, somebody. And it's important that you're able to identify the spiritual battles that we're in and that we are equipped to overcome them. It's something that can easily be overlooked because we don't see it. How many know out of sight, out of mind? And because we don't see it, a lot of times we don't realize how it's influencing our everyday decisions. It can be overlooked, yes. But then for other people, I've seen where that's the sole focus of everything. They become so spiritual that they're just, they're just strange. Hello, somebody. And it, it consumes them and it actually, it actually hinders them because all they see, that they're just all they can think about is the spiritual realm and they don't do anything to accomplish anything in the physical realm. And so throughout this series, I'm going to get in to try to equip you and to teach the church so that we're ready. I believe God is getting ready for breakthrough. I believe God is bringing revival. New people are about to come in, and we need to be ready to fight in the spiritual so that we can see it manifest in the physical. A lot of times if we go to God in the spiritual, we'll see the breakthrough that we're hoping for in the physical. You hear what I'm trying to teach you this morning? So we're going to get into this, and I want to get into this first segment. It's going to take many weeks of teaching to get cover it all. You're going to say, Pastor Richard, you left this scripture out. You left this scripture out. Don't worry, we're going to get there step by step. But this first segment is called Know Your Enemy. If you're going to fight in a battle, if there, means, if there is a war, and if we're declaring war, and we're saying this is war, then you have to know that there is an opposition, there is a battle that's being waged. That means there has to be an opponent. There has to be somebody to challenge. If, if the Spirit of God is saying this is a warfare that's going on, that means we have to recognize that there is an enemy, there is an opposition, and that's what we're going to be talking about. And it's funny, as I began to say that this series was going to be about spiritual warfare, I can't tell you how much attention goes towards the devil. Ooh, Pastor Richard, he's going to talk a lot about the devil. I'm telling you, we, we, we give him way too much credit sometimes. In fact, we look at everything that's going wrong and we're really quick to point out, oh, that must be the devil. We begin to see him everywhere where we begin to look at this person. Oh, the Republicans, they're, dem they're devils. The Democrats, they're devils. We look at our ex and our, and our old friends and say, oh, that's the devil. My boss is the devil. Heck, my kids are the devil. We begin to see the devil everywhere. Oh, the devil's over there. The devil shut my, broke down my car today. The devil caused me to run out of gas. No, you ran out of gas because you didn't put no gas in it. Devil fired me from my job. No, you didn't show up for work. You got fired. We begin to see the devil. I was looking out here like Bobby Boucher's mama saying, oh, that's the devil. Vicky Valancourt, that's the devil. They're the devil over there. They're the devil over there. They're the devil over there. <laughs> Talking about the water boy. <laughs> so much attention can go towards the devil. And the truth is there's, the devil's forces are real, but it's so much more than that. In fact, I found that those who focus the fight solely on the devil are usually the first ones to be knocked down. They lose their jobs, they have issues in their marriage, they have trouble in relationships, and they begin to sever relationships that would do them good, and, and, and they've put all their focus on the devil, not realizing that there might be some other issues going on besides just the devil working. They don't realize that even if you look at the scriptures, that the fall of man was not the devil's fault, but it was Adam's. That he chose to have the fruit. The reality was, if you really think about it, who put the serpent in the garden in the first place? You think he just snuck in there past God? He was there to tempt. And the reality is that Adam was the one. God gave him authority over that devil, over the serpent. But he chose not to use or exercise his authority because the reality was he wanted to taste the fruit. said it looked good. The reality was it wasn't the devil's fault that we fail. He tempted. But God allowed that temptation to be there. The reality was that it was, there was more going on than just the work of the devil. Understand that God gave Adam the authority. See, I, I want you to see sometimes we think there's too much power in hell and not enough power in heaven and that we can get the wrong people. I, I've seen people who think they're so powerfully spiritual and they're always talking about the devil and they're always talking about, but then I see them losing to the devil all the time. He's able to steal from them, steal relationships. And the reason why is because they ignore all these other things. They do nothing for their mental health. They do nothing uh, uh, for their skills and development. They don't read and study. They don't in increase their intelligence. They, in other words, they don't do anything else to grow. Everything must be the devil. So they don't mature. Oh, I, I, I'm losing today or I feel this way because of the devil. And they never mature to look deeper. What it, can it be? 
Why am I reliving the same mistakes? Why am I doing They never look deeper. Oh, it's just the devil. I'll just come to church, come to the altar. I feel good. Then they go home and they wonder why nothing changed. Well, God wants us to mature. In this series, this is an important note that I need you to understand. Uh, if, you, if, if, if you shut me off for the rest of it and you don't hear anything else, I want you to hear this. This is an important note. The Bible is not a book about the devil. The Bible is not a book to just tell us how to exercise the devil. This book, this Bible, is about God. The focus of the Bible is to get us to get closer to God, to draw close. How do we get close to God? How do we deepen our relationship with God? Because when we go closer with God, we overcome the devil already. You hear what I'm trying to tell you this morning? By getting close to God, you already have victory. Everything else is to draw you away from God so that you're vulnerable. And the Bible shows us what happens when men and women fall away from God. And when they distance themselves, they see that's when the enemy is able to come in. The Bible is not a book about the devil. It's a book about God. It's a book about our relationship. It's a book about our fall and our redemption. It's a book about victory that God took over the cross and how he torn down the enemy's lies. So the focus of the Bible is not about the devil. It's about God. You know why? Because God has already won. If you look at the Bible, we see that God has already won. He's got the victory. There is no, listen to me, there is no struggle between God and the devil. <laughs> I don't know if y'all catch this. There ain't no struggle between, there, there ain't no, the, God ain't arguing with the devil. <laughs> he said, maybe you're right, devil. Yeah, you're right. You know, you're making me think. There is no struggle between God and the devil. And though the battle is good versus evil, we know that good has already won. Because Jesus has the keys. Jesus has the authority. He already, he is the strong man. He already claimed victory on the cross. Our sins are forgiven. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because of what Jesus did when he shed his blood. The Bible is really clear that the light is stronger than the dark. That he is the one in authority. It's very clear. And your eyes would try to trick you. You see, I see darkness everywhere. See, that's part of the deception because the light is everywhere. God is everywhere. The spirit of God has been released on this earth. The power of God is here. And, and the enemy is not the one in authority. There's no struggle. When you're in a dark room, you turn off all the lights. It's dark. As soon as you hit that switch, does the light, does the light creep in? Does the light just take its time like, okay. Or does light expel darkness? You got to hear what I'm trying to say. But there is a struggle that we experience on earth, and there's a reason. The enemy wants you to think that the struggle is with him and him alone. But the truth is, is that we're actually fighting three enemies. We're actually fighting on three battles and three different fronts. Those things are, those three things are, and this is, you got to catch this. We're not just fighting against the enemy. We're actually fighting against the world. We're fighting against our own flesh and sinful nature. And we're fighting against the devil. Ooh, that's scary. You say we got three enemies. But the truth is, the Bible shows us that we are meant to overcome all these things in Christ. It, it, we're meant to, and through him and through what he's done, we're meant to overcome each one of these battles. And the Bible's really clear on how we overcome each one of these segments that we're fighting against. And guess what, church? I'll give you, I'll give you a hint that we're not the, really the ones that are overcoming any of it. God has already won. So the struggle is for us to realize where the battle, who the battle is with, and the struggle is simply God help me overcome it. And if we listen to what God says, we overcome. So let's get into this and let's talk about these three things. The first we're going to talk about the devil. Because the devil's been running the same playbook from the beginning to get you to surrender your place as a child of God. Our worship set brought you to a place so that you can receive this word. You are a child of God. You are not a slave to fear. You have nothing to fear. There is no condemnation for who, those that are in Christ. Your sins are forgiven. Listen, the devil's been running that playbook that you are not a child of God. And he fills us with temptations and lies. Listen, he's good at it. This is why I try to tell the church, stop focusing on the devil, and let's look a little bit deeper. He's real. He's there. We know he's there. But listen to what the scriptures say in 1 Peter chapter 5. Because I want you to see in verse, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, this is what it says. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Sober-minded. Why is it talking about the mind concerning the devil? 
Because you need to understand clearly, understand what's happening. It's not, a, a, it's not all the spiritual battle is taking place in the mind. And he's saying, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone who is out to devour. When in other words, he's looking for somebody who is walking in weakness or in isolation. He's looking for somebody who's not in the presence of God. Because he ain't coming to those that are in the presence of God. He can't come in. So he's looking around for who he can devour. Those that are away from God. Those that are angry with God. Those that are angry with their brother and angry with their pastor. He's looking for those ones because those are the ones that he can get. And he's like a roaring lion. Listen to this. But what does the Bible say in verse 9? The Bible says, resist him. Wait, wait. The Bible says, punch him in the mouth. No. The Bible says kick him in the, no. It says resist him, standing firm in the faith. In other words, take a position, take a stand. When he comes at you, you're not the one that's going to issue this fight. It says resist him. I'm not listening to you, devil. Stand firm on what? The faith, the word of God, the presence of God. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You're not the only one that's being oppressed. You're not the only one that's being fought against. But the Bible says resist him. Stand firm on the faith. This is important because the enemy wants you to think that you got to fight him one-on-one. -on -one. Like it's on. Oh, come on, devil. Yeah, let's go. We're going to fight this morning. I'm taking to, Pastor Richard said, we're in spiritual warfare. I'm going to go look for devils. Why would you focus on somebody that's already defeated? If, you, if, if that's a defeated foe, why is all the attention going to the defeated foe? Now, now you, you need to be acknowledged that he's there, he's working, he's trying to devour people. But why would we put all the focus there? See, he wants you to get into a fight that you can't win. How many people know that if there's a fight that you can't win, don't step in the ring? I don't want to step in the ring with Tyson Fury because I'll be knocked out in the first round. You know what I'm saying? I think the other guy got KO'd in a few rounds later. I probably won't pass round one. I'm not getting into that fight. <laughs> so he wants you to get in that fight because, listen, all we have to do, our job, is to expose the enemy to God, to bring him to the light, and then we got victory. Hello, somebody. We confess our sins to one another, and we confess our sins before God, so then he can't use, the devil can't use them against you because we know that they've already been forgiven. We bring the fight to the Lord and to the presence of God, to the word of God, because that is where the victory is. But the enemy wants you to get into a struggle with him. See, when I was younger and I was a young man coming up, I, 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 I was into scary movies and horror movies, and I fantasized about being this holy crusader when I came to God. Look, I'm going to be real for you a second. I wanted to be Demon Slayer. Oh, that's, that's Richard Hernandez, Demon Slayer. That's Richard Hernandez who cast out devils everywhere he goes. I wanted to be that holy crusader. We see it in all the movies like, oh, yeah, I'll be the exorcist. Hello. I'd go to people's houses and be like, where are your demons at? Where did you buy that? Looking for the demons. <laughs> I was all about it, and, and it was happening all over where people were throwing up demons, and, and they were screaming around and running around and rolling on the floors and all that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that's my fight. Get me in that. I want to be in God's army. It was crazy, though. And this is the truth, and I've been debating. Oh, should I really share this? But I was a young man. I was, must have been like 18 or 19, and this, you know, casting out demons was everywhere, and it was crazy. And, I, and let me tell you what was happening is that I was seeing them. I would suffer from sleep paralysis. I don't know if you know what that is, but you can't move and you're seeing shadow figures in your bed. And I would begin to see shadows pretty much everywhere. And I began to see things. And sometimes they'd be in my room after I would have Bible study in my early 20s. And I would see a shadow in my room. And I'd get, sometimes, I'll be real with you, sometimes I was scared. And other times I got up and prayed and I began to see and I realized that this is where my mind was constantly going. I was almost looking for this fight. And then it hit me that one night when I was there and I seen this shadow and I seen this thing. And I realized, like, God, this is not the spiritual war that I'm supposed to be waging right now. I saw so many people talking about the power of the devil in witchcraft more than I saw people preaching the word of God and more of the gospel and more of the salvation and the victory that Jesus had. We were so worried about where we might find the devil next. Like we go to the mall and they're playing secular music and the devil is entering in your head. This is the stuff that I was being taught as a young man. 
I saw the devil in everywhere, and I saw him in everybody. And instead of seeing people as a child of God, asking God to have mercy on them, I'd be like, you devil. People arguing more with people than loving on them. All in the name of the Lord. I said, ooh, I'm here to fight with them. I'm here to argue with them. I'm here to debate with them. I'm here to get them to manifest and spit on me. I saw people, that was their intention. We're going out street preaching, and hopefully we'll get some demons to manifest. This is what some people taught me. We're going out here to track down demons and get them to manifest. And they were proud when somebody would come at them and yell at them and scream at them and say, look at me, I'm being persecuted for Jesus. Then it hit me that this is not the battle that the Lord wanted me in. I'm talking personally. As I begin to witness this thing, uh, because let me tell you something. This is something I want you to realize. This is what happened in me. Now, I believe that we have authority over the enemy, and I believe there will be times in our lives where we got to cast out devils. No doubt about it in my mind. But listen, if the end result of your spiritual warfare causes you to be angry, judgmental towards other, prideful, as if you're doing something great in the kingdom and all you're doing is getting angry at people and arguing with people, then I'm telling you that you are in the wrong battlefield. The end result of our spiritual warfare can't be judgment. It can't be anger. It has to come out and equate to the same thing that Jesus did. He had love for the sinners. It has to change and transform your heart. You can't desire to be some holy warrior out there. You have to come from a place of genuinely wanting to see people come to Jesus. Luke chapter 10, it says it like this. Now, I, I, this is what happened. When I had that revelation one night and I realized that it had to be more to it, God had me go to Luke chapter 10 because that is where Jesus sent out 70 people to go cast out demons. And listen to this in verse 17 when they come back. He gave them the authority. But listen to this. In verse 17 it says, when the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They came back excited like we out there, we doing it, God. And he said to them, listen, man, this right here, this struck me. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall any means hurt you. And right there, that's where I used to stop. That he gave me the authority. He gave me the power over the enemy. Then it hit me. What did he mean when he said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning? We know that Satan's fall was pride. God gave Satan a position of authority, and that a position of authority thought he could be like God. So much so that he tried to convince other people to follow him because of the position that God gave him, and he had his own idea of what it should be like. And so the Bible says that Satan fell from heaven like lightning, but God is the one that gave him his position. Then it hit me that God gave me who, made me who I am. God is the one that gave me my authority, and, and I cannot abuse it. The only reason why I am anything is because of what Jesus has done in my life. And then I read verse 20. It says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your name is written in heaven. Not to focus on the authority, not to focus on the devils that you're casting out. But for me, it was like focus on this reality that this is all about. Is your name written in heaven and is their name written in heaven? And the goal is to say, God, help them. Let me go out there and make a difference in their lives so that their names can be written in heaven. He, he said, listen, I saw Satan because of pride, because he thought he was somebody. I saw him fall from, I saw him fall from the heavens. I saw him forsake the position that God gave him because of his own pride. And he says, so don't rejoice in the authority that I'm giving you, but rejoice that you have a relationship with me, and that relationship leads to salvation. Rejoice and give thanks because salvation has come to the earth and that God can bring hope to the hopeless. Rejoice that the broken and those sinner can be saved. By the blood of the Lamb. These are the things that we worship God for. Not because we have authority over the devil. He's already defeated. But rejoice because he's bringing salvation to the world. You know, when I was doing this, I would realize, I would pray for people and they would feel better. They would say, man, Pastor Richard, that word. You get, man, I got the shakes, the quakes, the cries, all of that. And then weeks would go by later and they'd come up, pray for me again. I need deliverance. Same devil, same struggle. Pray for me, God. I need, a, I, need another, I need another one of those Holy Ghost moments. I realized that 
Maybe we need to be teaching them and equipping them differently so they're not coming back with the same thing. Now, there are some times where we have struggles, and, and sometimes it takes persistence. But when I'm talking about people who never grew, never matured, to realize that the only authority, it's not in a man, it's not even at a church altar. It's in Christ Jesus alone, faith, profession in him alone. It is the work of the Spirit. It's the work of the anointing of God. And he can touch you right there on the street. He can touch you in your room. He can transform your household. He can bring his presence right in your car. It's not just come to me and I'll set you free. You know, the real fight, the real struggle, and this is the thing I want to focus in on, the real struggle is in the other two battles, the world and the flesh. Because these are the battles that we fight every day, and when we lose ground in those areas, it gives room for the enemy to operate in your life. And when the enemy begins to operate in your life, he begins to establish strongholds and destructive behavioral habits that you will keep perpetrating. You will keep doing over and over again. You'll build it as a habit, almost like muscle memory, like you'll crave certain things. That the enemy will begin to plant those things in your whole body. Your whole mind becomes deceived that you do these things over and over again. Listen, Christian or not, you can still struggle with sin. Especially sin that you keep in the dark, that you hide in shame and you won't bring to the light. You will struggle with these things and they will become strongholds in your life. And you'll lose these battles all the time because the only way to be set free is to bring it to the light. You can still, as a Christian, be influenced and whispered to by the enemy. The spiritual oppression is real. You can feel these things. But listen, you can fight back and you can overcome temptation. But you got to know that you're fighting against not only the world, but your own sinful nature. See, this is where I got to call time out because I, I need to make sure you're still with me. Because this is where I want to get into spiritual warfare and I'm going to talk about some real things that you need to be equipped here and I need you to endure with me as I get into this. You all with me? So I'm going to call time out. Take a breath. All right. The world in the flesh. Daily battles. You're saying that being a Christian, I got to fight daily. You're not fighting for your salvation. Faith in Jesus alone has brought assured salvation. He cannot steal once you believe in what Jesus has did. It's not a fight for your salvation. It's a fight against your flesh and the world. That's the struggle. You don't got to worry about, oh, my sins, I'm so guilty. You're not guilty anymore because of what Jesus has already done. But you are fighting against your sinful nature, destructive behavioral habits, and the patterns of this world. You all with me? So let me break this down. I got to get into this. First, let's talk about the world. The world is a system. It is the ideology of the world. It is the structure of the world, the secular world. It is the way that it's established. It is who's in charge. Listen, let me tell you something about the devil. The devil is not God. The devil is a little G God that's barely even a G because he's not really a G because he's already been stomped on by the, by the work of Jesus. Listen, listen, the devil is not omnipresent. He is not all-knowing. He cannot read your thoughts. He does not predict the future. Hello, somebody. He is not God. But we let him in by invitation or deception, and he has set up a system to mess with us. He is a master tempter. He knows what got your parents. He knows what generational. He knows what you do. He studies your patterns so that he can make it seem like he knows what he's doing. But he doesn't know your future. The only future he knows is that one day he's going to be tossed into a pit of fire. That's the future that he knows because it is written. And that his rule is only temporary because it is written in the word of God. That's the future the devil knows. He doesn't know your future. He's not omnipresent. Y'all hearing me this morning. But he has set up a system that will lead you to see and pull you in temptation in the world. And the farther you get away from God, the easier it is for you to fall to the world system. That's why it becomes easier the more, the less you do it. It becomes easier for you not to go to church and not to pray and not to read because you'll get pulled further away from God. You'll get into all these other things that take priority over the things of God. And next thing you know, say, I'll be at church next week. Don't worry, I'll be there, Pastor Richard. Three weeks later, I'll, I'll come in. I'm coming. I'll, and I'll be like, okay, at least are you praying? Are you watching online? You're like, yes. <laughs> The further you get away from God, the easier it is for you to put these things. If you're close to God, you don't want to miss church. You don't want to miss his presence. If you don't want to miss the time and the read. Listen, listen, if it's a struggle for you, it's because you're not close with God. You're being pulled away. 
but Pastor, I can't be at church every Sunday. I'm not saying be at church every Sunday. If it's becoming easier and easier for you to miss the presence of God, you're being pulled away. You're now vulnerable to be devoured by the enemy. Y'all here? Okay. Oh, man, people are walking out. Look at that. They're walking out right now. I'm just kidding. Everybody's looking around. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're leaving. People are tuning me off on Facebook right now. Listen, the world system is simply its ideology, its order of doing things. And God calls us out of that system. He calls us out of that system of the world and into the kingdom of God. And that is God's authority, and that is God's way of doing things. So he calls us. We are to live in this world, but we are not of it. We've been brought out of this world and into the kingdom of God. So listen, listen, when we, that doesn't mean that, oh, the earth is evil and we can't enjoy anything that's going on in the earth. That's not what it means. We can still enjoy the blessing. God created the earth. He said it was good. There's still good in here. What it means is that you are not going to fall in the world system, that you are going to come out of that system and into the kingdom of God. That's God's way of thinking. Talking about this ideology that you got to know how to identify it, fight it, so you can leave that world and live in the kingdom. Y'all with me this morning? I'm going to try to summarize this. The world system, what is he talking about? Because, I mean, there's a long list of things I can do, but I'll give you. Every system has to have key driving points, key things. Two of the summarized things I can say about the world that drives that system. And all you have to do is look around and you'll know what I'm saying is true. They are sexual immorality and the love of money. You'll see that everything that goes on in the world is either driven by this sex or money. And sex and money themselves are not evil things. Only when corrupted by the enemy, only when corrupted by sin do these things become destructive. See, sexual immorality is a form of adultery or idol worship. It separates us from the Spirit of God. And the love of money is a false sense of pride and power. And so it's important to realize that if that's what the world is trying to entice me with, then how do I pull away? Listen, you want to find the evil in politics? Follow the money. You want to know why the people, there's evil in your neighborhood? Follow the money. Why people do evil things that they do? Follow the money. You'll find that money is such a, is such a thing that leads us all astray. If you want to be easily weighed astray by the enemy, simply follow money and pursue riches. You'll fall away from God so fast it'll make your head spin. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6, you can't serve two masters. You love one, you hate the other. But he says you can't serve both God and money. He puts money right up there with a God that you would serve. And you can see that's how the world is set up. The Bible says, 1 Timothy, that the love of money is the roots of all kinds of evil. What leads people astray is money. The world wants to think you need this. You've got to have this. You know what the truth of the matter is? That if the devil really wants to pick a fight with you, all he's got to do is mess with your bank account a little bit. All he got to do is mess with your money a little bit. All of a sudden, you pull right away from God. You say, "Uh uh-uh, I don't believe your word no more, God. I got bills to pay. If he gets you worried about money and what you should wear, what you should buy, you got to have these clothes, he don't even got to fight you no more. He's already done his job. He'll just let you sit in that stress about money. Wants to break up your marriage, what does he got to do? Attack the money. I saw you spend $20. What'd you buy that $20 on? I saw the ATM receipt. What did you buy for that $20? Boom, marriage already kind of getting messed with. Hello? He don't got to fight you spiritually. All he got to do is mess with your money. Oh, come you, It's the world's ideology, the system. <laughs> y'all, y'all don't know if y'all hearing me. tries to lie to you and say that God just wants you rich or God just wants you poor. He all, what he really wants is to get to you that God just worried about your money. God, the Bible says seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things he'll add on to you. You don't got to worry about what you wear, what you eat. He says he takes care of the sparrow. He's surely going to take care of you. The Bible says you don't even got to worry about it. So the devil makes you worried about it. Because then you question God's word. Do I really got to give 10%? Can we negotiate down to two, three, every other month? What are you doing? You're questioning God's at his word and his promise. (laughs) I could teach you so much about the love of money and what it does. I could teach you about how sexual immorality, when it enters, how it severs you and causes you to pursue pleasure instead of the things of God. 
and it corrupts your relationship. All of a sudden, you're not satisfied in your marriage no more. You're not satisfied with the husband or the wife that God gave you. And you're not rejoicing and working together as God intended when he said, this is the woman I make her to help you. Instead, you're divided because you're looking somewhere else. You're, 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 you're committing adultery. You're looking other places. And if you're looking other places in your marriage, you'll do the same to God. You'll be looking at God with one day and you'll be looking at the world for satisfaction the other. What happens in the spiritual manifests in the physical. But when you're in love with the Lord and when you're not deceived by the enemy, you can love your wife like Christ loved the church. Outside of that, your flesh says, oh, she's not bad looking. Your eyes can deceive you. So the world set up a system. The system is there to get you to wonder. Social media is there to get your eyes to wonder. Can't go to the movies. Can't watch TV. Can't even watch a, a, a Disney Channel <laughs> without the world's deception. Get you to question gender. And get you to question sexuality. Get you to question everything. Because then all you're just questioning, well, why does God's word say this? It's not right. It's a strategy set up in the world system. Do you hear what I'm saying to you this morning? <clears throat> Romans chapter 12 says, you got to hear this scripture. It says, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. Paul, he said, I plead that you would give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable this is truly the way to worship him. He says, give your bodies as an act of worship. To give your desires, your hearts as an act of worship. Listen to verse 2. It says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you. Say, transform me into a new person by changing the way you think. Wait a minute. Transform by changing the way you think, the way you perceive, the what you value, changing the way you think in your mind, what you feel is important. But you're talking about spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is in the way you think and what you prioritize, what you set your eyes upon. Then you will know and learn God's will for your life, which will be good, pleasing, and perfect. How do I know how to fight? Give your bodies over to God. Don't, behave, don't follow the customs of this world. As I wind this down, listen. Because I can't, I, can't, I can't overfeed you today. But the greatest enemy that we fight is ourselves. Our own flesh, our own sinful nature, our own mind, because it, whatever you focus on, wherever your attention is, wherever you put your heart, that's what really matters. And the trill spiritual warfare is fighting against your own flesh that will draw you away from God, to get your attention away from God. You are fighting the battle because if I can only get to the presence of God, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, if I can only get to Jesus, if I can only get in his presence, then he can set me free. And so your sinful nature says, don't go there. Your flesh says, no, I like where we are. And we battle against ourselves. The enemy simply tries to tempt your own flesh. But we don't realize that we're fighting against ourselves. We think we're fighting against just the devil. Because if you can win the battle against your flesh, you can overcome the enemy and his schemes. Because when you give your heart over to God, he is stronger. When you give your heart over to God, you're a threat to the enemy. He's not even sure he wants to mess around with you that day because he's afraid of what you might pray. He's afraid of what you might do. When you're really in the presence of God, he's like, I don't know if I should mess with him today because every time I try to wake him up, he gets up and praises the name of the Lord. Every time I try to tell him about his past, he reminds me of my future. Every time I try to persecute him, he begins to proclaim the goodness of God. I don't know if I want to mess with him today. I don't know if y'all hearing me. 
change the way you behave in temptation and watch what happens in the spiritual war because when you give your heart to God he sets you free he sets you free from addiction depression from loneliness he empowers you to overcome to break chains the anointing it breaks chains but but he gives us the Holy Spirit but guess what in your mind you still have to decide am I going to live by the spirit am I going to live by the flesh the Bible says that the flesh is willing I mean the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak Paul says, I die daily. I got to put down that flesh every single day. I got to remind myself, I don't ever want to be that old man. I want to live by the Spirit. So that why does the enemy want to draw you away? Because when he takes away your prayer life, you're vulnerable and he can devour you. <laughs> Y'all hear what I'm saying? People think spiritual warfare says, I got to go find the devils and call them out by name. I got to know and write down who the, all the angels are and what angels are with me. There's spiritual warfare in heaven. Look, we'll get into all that. The real battle's taking place in your heart and your mind. Your heart and your mind. And if God can do a work in those areas, because he says, do not conform to the powers of the world, but be transformed in the way you think. And if you can get out of the world and get into the kingdom of God, and you can receive the Spirit, I'm telling you, you'll be mighty in God. But it's a process. It's a daily battle, and that's why Christians give up. Because they don't want to fight every day. And I get it, it's hard, but... If you say, Pastor Richard, I want to learn about spiritual warfare, it's every day. Say, every day. Every day. <laughs> so you remember. Because that way when days go by and you haven't been in the presence of God, you got to say, wait a minute. And you're starting to see little shadows and you're starting to get afraid of somebody casting a spell on you, a voodoo spell on you or something. You got to say, is the presence of God with me? Then I got to worry about it. You can do your little incantations. You can give your little crystals. You can do all that stuff. I ain't worried about it. But Pastor Richard, they put a spell on me. Are they stronger than God's word and his presence? And if you're seeing the struggle, just look deeper and let's be real. Confess your sins before God. Go before him. Run to help. Say, God, I'm going to pray with somebody. I'm not hiding this sin any longer. I'm bringing it out. And watch what happens. When... Everything is brought to the light. Jesus has authority in heaven and on earth. There is no principality. There is no authority. There is no word. There's no sickness. There's no disease that is above his name. The spirit that <laughs> the spirit of God that's in you is greater than that of this world. Do you hear this? Oh, but the world, it got me. The devil got me. Is the spirit living in you or not? Because it's greater than the things of this world. The battle is happening in your mind. Know your enemy. The, def the devil is a defeated foe. The battle is to resist him by drawing close to God. You hear that? Resist him. Devil, I'm not hearing you. I'm, res I'm resisting and I'm drawing close to God. Now I ain't got to hear from you today. The world system is nothing compared to the kingdom of God. And the flesh we got to put down daily so that we can live by the spirit. Y'all with me? I'll wrap it up with this, James chapter 4. I want to teach you a scripture that's deep in spiritual warfare, and this is my last, last thought. It's kind of a long scripture, but follow with me. Listen to this. James chapter 4 says this, what's causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? Where is this quarrel? Where is this fight coming from? Where is this argument coming from? It's coming from within you. These own things that are in you, like you have some real problems. Hello. We all do. Verse 2 says, you want what you don't have. Hello, we can relate. So it says, you scheme and kill it to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take away from them. You're looking at, why are they blessed? Why do they have this? Hey, something ain't right. I got to do something. I got to make something happen. The world system will cause you to chase riches and to look at things you don't have. And all of a sudden, you're never satisfied. Jesus isn't enough. You're never satisfied. You always want something else. This is the work of the enemy. The work of the flesh but listen to this it says you you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it you don't go before God you go to your th your thoughts and verse 3 is the key and even when you ask you don't get it because your motives are all wrong you want what will only give you pleasure 
The flesh is motivated by pleasure, what feels good and not what's right and what God's perfect will for your life is. We're at war with ourselves, but the Spirit's got to change our motives. Verse 4, this is where it gets hard. It says, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend to the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Because the, the things of this world, that's not God's values, not his standards. You think the scriptures have no meaning. This is why the enemy wants you to question all these other things that the Bible's clear about, but it wants you to question it. Because the world says this is, this is wrong for you to do this. It's judgmental. It's, it's, it's making you a bad person by saying these things. They say that God is passionate, that the spirit has placed within us. Should we be faithful to him? And he gives us grace generously. Say grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. When we think self-righteousness and pride, that's not it. We're not going to be better than anybody else, but he gives grace to the humble. Listen, humility is not pacifism. Being humble before God doesn't mean you're just, oh, I'm just going to take every punch that everybody's going to throw at me. No, that's not what it means. But listen to verse 7. It says, here's your key to the fight. So humble yourself before God. Be vulnerable before God. Open your hearts before God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. When we humble ourselves, he says, I give grace to the humble. Grace is unearned favor. When the grace of God is on your life, the devil flees. When we go before the Lord, and we say, I am nothing without you, Lord. The devil flees. Verse 8. You got to walk out of this. Come close to God. How do we do this? How do we humble ourselves? Come close to God. And God will come close to you. Wait, I thought God just goes wherever I'm at. Come close to God. Come make the effort. Come to him. And he gets closer than him. But listen to this. Listen to this. It says, wash your hands, all you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. The real battle is right here. A loyalty divided between the things of God and the world. Wash your hands is a call to action. Listen, listen. Do you wash your hands one time and you're done? Hello, you're going to have some dirt back on your hands. He says, purify your hearts. Does your heart feel good one day and broken the next? You don't wash your hands one day. So why didn't we fight against the flesh only one day out of the week when I come to church? Why do I lay my, purify my heart one day out of the week? You don't, you don't, you don't wash your hands one week. It's daily. Let's pray. Father, Speak to the nature of this war. Let every heart in here realize that they are in a war. This means war. The enemy is being exposed for his devices this morning. That you're raising up a church and a people in power. And God, they realize that this is a battle that we take daily. That every day, God, we fight against the temptations of this world. And when we struggle and when we fall, you don't condemn us. You simply say, come to me, draw close to me, and I'll draw close to you. The Lord is saying that you're never too far away, but you got to make the effort and come. Wash your hands. Purify your hearts, O oh sinners. And the Lord will set us free. We thank you today for your word. We receive this teaching in the mighty name of Jesus. If you receive this word, can you give the Lord some praise? Wow. <laughs> we are exposing the enemy's lies. Listen, if you need prayer. The Lord told me there's going to be days. you got to walk away with this. The Lord told me there'll be days we'll do altars. We'll, can, we'll really get down and to pray. But I'm going to dismiss you right now. But listen, if you're here today and you're not sure that you know Jesus and you're not sure that you're born again, do not walk out of here without coming to the front. You say, oh, but, but I'm afraid to. Listen, you got to resist the devil. you got to resist that urge that I'm hungry and i got to go. And I'm telling you, if today is your day of salvation, do not walk out of these doors. Make the decision. We want to talk to you. The second thing, if you need prayer because you've been fighting against the enemy and you've been struggling, you didn't get your breakthrough during worship, you can come up. We'll pray for you. 
but walk out of here knowing that this teaching was for you. I want you to meditate. I want you to think. I want you to find some time today and say, Lord, what were you speaking to me? Because what you do when you leave this church can determine how well you're going to fight this battle in these coming weeks. You hear what I'm saying? you got to take it with you. So this morning, we're not going to make a big thing at the altar. You're going to go home, open up your Bible, read James chapter 4, read the whole chapter. I'm telling you, it will bless you. You open up and say, God, let your presence, like I felt this morning, I want to feel it right here. Show me in this word, how does this pertain to my spiritual battle I'm in right now? You open up your word. You're doing exactly what spiritual warfare is. You hear what I'm saying this morning? It doesn't happen just here at the church. Now, we're going to go to war with the enemy. Next week, you know somebody in addiction. You know somebody that is dealing with, with uh, schizophrenia. You're dealing with people that have mental disorders. You're dealing with people that need healing in their body. Bring them next Sunday. Today, you're going to go home and you're going to say, God, speak to me in your word. Amen? God bless you guys. If you need prayer, come on up.